gentlemen. The development of the fourth industrial revolution technologies is critical to the future of defense and security capabilities. The commercial high-tech sector, applied research, startup companies, telecommunication, energy, and financial industries are all investing in these same technologies. Defense and security collaboration with this broad set of actors is certainly the right approach to accelerate innovation, adaptation of new technologies, and the capabilities they enable. However, this age of collaboration in many cases is imposing difficulty to resolve commercial and security challenges. In this environment of corporation critical emerging technologies such as AI and unmanned systems are diffusing through a number of channels, both licit and illicit to state and non-state threat actors who will use these technologies in creative and difficult to anticipate ways to disrupt security and stability. Development in AI, frequently in conjunction with other fourth industrial revolution technologies, is also driving new and rapidly diffusing capabilities, supporting improved situation awareness, autonomous systems, training and simulation, communication and information operation. This session will seek to diagnose the nature of diffusion challenge and thus assess the ways in which governments, the private sector, academia can work both independently in a collaborative fashion to minimize and mitigate emerging threats associated with the diffusion of AI and other novel fourth industrial revolution technologies. I would like to introduce our distinguished panelist on stage, His Excellency Omar al ulama Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence, Digital Economy and Remote Work Application. Michael Johansson, President and CEO, SAP AB. Eric Pippen, Executive VP, Technical and Innovation Officer from Naval Group. Joining us virtually from United States, Heidi Grant, Director of Defense Security Corporation Agency. Starting with Your Excellency, I would like to get your perspective on what are the implications of diffusion of AI technologies in UAE security? Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for putting together this wonderful event that comes at a critical time uh, when it comes to defending the sovereignty of our nations, when it comes to trying to understand what comes next beyond the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. When we look at the UAE, the UAE is a country that looks ahead and plans proactively rather than reactively towards the changes that are at the periphery. We look at artificial intelligence as a technology that is going to reshape the world as we know it. We see that because in the past, we're going to look at defense specifically. Defense was focused on defending humans because humans were the source of productivity. Humans were the source of return and, econ and the economy as well. Today, we're seeing increasing infusion of systems that are as productive, that are as critical to our economies, to our sovereignty, to our countries as human beings. The financial system in countries are being led by machines. We're seeing machines take over large parts of the GDP producing um, efforts within a country. So defending these systems is as critical as defending the sovereignty of the nation, defending lives as well. We've done uh, the planning side by actually looking at the cybersecurity angle. The UAE today has a chief cybersecurity officer that looks at securing these systems. We've invested in companies that are going to invest billions of dollars in R&D, whether it's Edge in Abu Dhabi, whether it's other entities as well, like Desk, for example, in Dubai. And we're planning always to ensure that we are at the cutting edge of how do we secure these systems, at the cutting edge of understanding what can be done to create a protective layer, and also to create a homegrown talent that can take the UAE to the next step and to the future, inshallah. Thank you. That's an interesting point, Your Excellency, which leads to my next question for Michael. How do you describe the challenge of diffusion of novel technologies, and how is it unfolding? Well, first of all, I'm, I mean, we, we, may, we can't sort of stop technology development, and much of this 
fantastic technology is now driven by the commercial sector. And uh, as long as that is managed uh, in a good society way, of course, it's a fantastic thing for societies going forward and also for the defense industry. Um, if you're adopting it in a professional way, uh, if you carefully handle it and in an ethical way. Uh, but of course, if it gets in the wrong hands, it, it's, it's a big, big problem, of course. So right now, I mean, we as a defense industry, we're used to absorbing this technology and we are careful about, and to us, it's a license to operate to make sure that we are not exposed to theft and espionage and, and things like that. And we're used to that. The problem is, of course, the commercial sector, which has no regulations whatsoever. And I, I would say that uh, many of the channels we see today, some, some many are completely legal, of course, uh, normal e-commerce type of, of channels where you can get access to technology. And, uh, and also more hard to find, find places like the dark net, but also still theft and espionage, of course. I, I strongly believe that the biggest problem right now is, I think, um, software. Mm -hmm. there are millions and millions of lines of code out there, excellent code packages that if you're reasonably skilled and you combine technologies, you can do dangerous stuff. And that's what we see happens, of course. I think we have to think about how we divide also the maturity level of these technologies in terms of, we call it test readiness levels or something. We are all for the collaboration between industry, academia, and, and government authorities going forward. But you have to be careful on what kind of maturity level you have the technologies and when you start regulating them. And I guess we will get back to what do we do about this, of course, because it's going to be worse and worse in this connected society. And uh, we, we see Lots of dangerous stuff now being used in combination to great, um, well, scary things going forward. Mm. Thank you. To build on your point, uh, Eric, since you're coming from defense and marine renewable energy, I would like to hear your view on what technology do you see as being most, as most dangerous as, as they diffuse and why? Yes. First of all, there are not... Uh, bad technologies, there are only bad uses of technologies. That's very important. For example, if you take a 3D printing, which is one of the new technology uh, coming with the uh, fourth industrial revolution. Uh, this 3D printing can be made, uh, it can be used sorry, for, for, to, to realize propellers for ships, but at the same time, you can use also this 3D printing to do uh, counterfeit spare parts or to do undetectable handguns. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, we all know that uh, the technology is not the problem. The problem is uh, the use yes. that the people can make of this technology. So, if we do a, a short analysis of uh, what could be the diffusion of this technology and what could be the risk and the dangerousness of the technology, uh, first of all, we have to take the list, the cybersecurity technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, of course, 3D printing, virtual mm -hmm. reality, augmented reality, uh, Internet of Things, blockchain, robotics, all these technologies are not dangerous, okay? But the characteristic of this technology is that the pace of innovation is rapid, that can be embedded in the miniaturized components. They are very accessible in terms of technical and intellectual means, in fact, for everybody, and they are affordable. You can, you can buy a, an uh, aerial uh, drone for uh, uh, 100 euro. And they can bring surprise effect. And for our system, our critical system, it is very important uh, to be aware of the risk of this technology mm -hmm. and to be able, because our systems are full of software, they are very connected, uh, to be able to put the good answer uh, to, uh, to uh, fight these risks. Our conclusion uh, as a shipbuilder and critical system designer is that the most critical technologies are artificial intelligence, embedded in unmanned vehicles. And these unmanned vehicles can, of course, carry dangerous payloads like explosives or, or biotechs. Second, uh, second technology is the swarms of drones. Mm -hmm. okay? Even if today they are only teleoperated for most of them, uh, if they become very intelligent, that can be a, a great uh, threat on our naval forces. And of course, at least 
cybersecurity technologies combined with uh, artificial intelligence, with cyber attacks, with uh, serious deep fakes can be uh, very, very problematic. So we focus in Naval Group our innovation uh, efforts uh, in order to stay one step ahead for this technology, for these risks, and uh, to be able to, uh, to uh, uh, design systems that can be able to detect, to contain, and to neutralize these threats if needed. Mm -hmm. Coming to our virtual panelist, Heidi. How does the DSCA support the unique requirements of foreign partners that deviate from traditional military equipment? I just wanna say thank you for this opportunity to, to join you and my colleagues here virtually. I think the hardest thing for me was knowing that all of you were on a tea break and I wasn't able to participate. But uh, again, thank you uh, to the United Arab Emirates for its continued leadership in the, in the region. Uh, to answer the question, there's a variety of methods that we employ to support our foreign partners. Um, two areas that I'd like to identify specifically, one is the non-program of record process. And I wanna talk about that one because what we're seeing more and more, well, historically you know, a decade ago, many of our partners uh, would not request the transfer of US equipment until it was in the US military inventory. What we're seeing more and more is we're seeing our international partners requesting um, technology that our uh, private industry has that isn't a program of record. So we're setting up a process for that to broaden the scope of available systems and provide allies and partners with competitive options for these systems acquisitions. And we've developed this approach, non-program of record for four military sales uh, to address technology transfer also for direct commercial sales will be supported. Um, it'll allow us to increase our competitive, competitiveness, not just focusing on the effort on a particular system used by the United States military, but new innovative systems that you're hearing about today and provide an equivalent and sometimes even improved capability. So I highlight this because it really embodies um, the collaborative effort and how we need to keep up with the latest technology uh, that's being introduced that can really help us all um, you know, meet these global challenges. The second area is our DOD focus uh, to develop for export. This area, developing for export, again, we're finding where, as I mentioned, a lot of the partners Previously, we're not requesting until we had it in our inventory. Um, by then, it's too late to develop for export. So we're instituting a process, trying to change the culture within the United States Defense Department now. When we build something, build it with the assumption that our partners are also uh, going to want to have the same technology, advanced technologies we bring into our inventory. So we're changing our processes to build for export up front. Thank you. Coming back to our panelists on stage to understand more in depth your excellency with the responsibilities that you carry in UAE government. What challenges and threats does the diffusion of AI technologies create for communities? There are many challenges when it comes to deploying AI, namely um, actually ignorance within the decision making process. Mm -hmm. If the people that are deploying these systems do not understand what these systems are capable of, you'll always have um, black swan events that come up and actually uh, impact people's lives negatively. So trying to remove that layer of ignorance, trying to educate people, trying to create expertise within every vertical of government is extremely important. And that's something that we've worked on for the past couple of years with the University of Oxford, for example. The other side of it is AI is an incredible technology. It has a lot of potential for the future, but there are certain things that it is capable of and there are other things that it isn't capable of. If the variables are set, if we've trained the algorithm enough on a big amount of data, that can do incredible things. If the variables are not set and it needs to work in an environment that has a lot of changing uh, factors, if it does not have enough um, training data sets that have the diversity that it needs, there's always the issues of bias, there's always the issues of taking the wrong decisions, and if you don't understand how these systems work, there's an, uh, there's an impact there as well. The third factor when it comes to challenges because of AI 
is the fact that if they were not developed locally, or if the country itself was not part of the development, there's always a chance of backdoor access, there's always a chance of some people poisoning certain data sets or mm -hmm. impacting these systems in a negative way that will lead to detrimental impact on the country. Mm -hmm. True. Michael, uh, are there any useful analog we can consider that can help us understand the nature of threat and potentially separate the real threat from any exaggerations related to technology diffusion? An example of that would be the improvised explosive, uh, explosive device. Well, again, <clears throat> um, we have to sort of look at the different maturity levels of technology and how you combine technologies. Uh, and it's not to prevent technologies from spreading, it's about applications and how to track what they're used for that is important. Um, and I mean, there are many things mentioned here to get today. I mean, software packages, if you're skilled, you can use, but of course the drones that are extremely sophisticated today and yes, sort of a few hundred dollars as, as one person said here today, can be used to, uh, to do terrible stuff if you, you adapt them, so to say. And it, it, it's getting worse if, if technologies and software will be available for um, GPS-free navigation if that comes into the hands of the guys that wants to handle drones, for example, that will be uh, terrible, and that is more or less only software, and it's done today, but it's, it's done within the defense industry, so that cannot sort of be available in the marketplace. And there are many more examples. The, the 3D printing thing was mentioned, I think that uh, will be dangerous going forward to make sure what, what you can do and not do with 3D printing in terms of, of uh, cr incredible shortcuts uh, to, do, to do bad things. So many, many examples, but again, uh, we, we need to get somewhere where we have some sort of regulation around um, applications, technology types and maturity, um, how to, uh, what, to, but to use them for, we need an arrangement like a, maybe the Vassenar arrangement uh, that w was implemented in '96. But take that to the next level, because it's time to start regulating. And, we'll t and that has to be done by states, uh, because it has to include the commercial sector. There are no laws in many countries today for the wrong actors to come and buy startups with great technology, and, and we don't control that today. So there are many scary things, but the, the, good si the good side of this must prevail because it's so fantastic for the, the majority of the society and all other applications. Mm -hmm. Eric, to take this discussion further, what sort of tools and methods would be useful in understanding how these diffuse technologies might be used to understand, undermine security, stability, prosperity in the region and beyond? The first tool that we need is collaboration. Mm -hmm. Collaboration between academia, collaboration between industrial sectors, uh, not only defense sectors, but also dual sectors that share the same objective regarding these technologies. And of course, collaboration between countries, because for low technology readiness level subjects, there is absolutely no obstacle for this collaboration. We have all the tools needed to collaborate, to, uh, to build partnerships, to, uh, to have the policy for IP rights. We are ready for that, and we are already doing that. Uh, second point, which is very important for me, is the simulation tools. We need absolutely, first, to use digital twins of our systems, of, but also digital twins of what could be the threats uh, due to these new technologies if they are used by uh, illicit uh, people. Uh, with this simulation, we can uh, compare what could be the result with the realistic scenarios, realistic environment, what could be the result of combat between our systems and these adverse threats. Mm -hmm. We can do also serious games with this scenario in order to improve our system and to know what are the limits of, this, of the opponent's strengths. Another thing which is very important is that the man is always in the loop. For, in our case, for naval uh, ships, the crew is in the loop of the decision, especially when the decision uh, is uh, related to the weapon utilization. 
So we need to train the people. So we need training facilities, we need battle labs in order to have collaboration between military people, technical people, but also data scientists from university, from partners, uh, in order to, uh, to check uh, that uh, the solutions that we put on our, in our artificial uh, intelligence system are perfectly uh, suited with uh, the purpose in the naval systems. Okay. Thank you. Coming back to Heidi, we'd like to hear your view on how does the DSCA and the US Department of Defense engage with companies and organizations that are developing new technologies which can help counter future threats and adversaries? The Department of Defense is always thinking, you know, of how to counter future threats to the United States and our allies. You know, and we encourage our industry partners to innovate as much as possible. You know, we're, we're constantly advocating for more research and development funding uh, in that area. Uh, DSCA has a regular engagements with the U.S. industrial base, and it encourages companies of all sizes to come in and discuss their product lines and challenges that may be they may be experiencing with exporting their products. Uh, one area that we've been working also, we've uh, started to build a relationship with the Defense Innovation Unit within the United States Department of Defense, and the Defense Innovation Unit contracts with companies to find um, scalable commercial solutions to overcome national security challenges. And we believe that the partnership with their expertise will help ensure we're able to bring innovative solutions to our partners and allies. And then, as you mentioned in the very opening comments, the other area that we're working very closely with is academia. You know, there's a lot of uh, bright uh, young students at our science and engineering uh, universities, and we've been collaborating with them also. Okay, thank you. From the shared thoughts during our discussion, we realized the impact and the threat of AI and the diffusion of uh, fourth industrial revolution technologies on defense and security, which leads to my next question for you, Your Excellency. What reshaping and rescaling needs are required to build a tech-ready task force? The most important element here is actually the human uh, side of it, actually having local capabilities that are able to develop these systems, that are able to work with these systems, and also understand these systems moving forward. Mm -hmm. The other side would be the hardware side, having the compute capability to be able to work on simulation, as Eric mentioned, for example, uh, having the systems on the ground necessary to ensure effective deployment of artificial intelligence across the country, for example. Cloud capabilities is a big thing here. Um, quantum, for example, if we were able to crack quantum uh, at an affordable scale as well, is going to be extremely critical. The important factor here is to ensure that we are able to develop our skill sets as a nation as the technology develops. We are at the very beginning of this technology. Although AI might seem extremely smart today, and it is extremely smart on certain things, like, for example, diagnosing specific diseases, but there are some mundane tasks that AI is not smart in. And I'll give you a simple example. I was looking at the um, translation, the live translation, which I'm pretty sure is being done by an artificial intelligence algorithm. Mm -hmm. And when Eric mentioned the importance of trying to stop 3D printing of weapons, it didn't say that, you know, we need to stop printing guns. It said we need to stop printing penguins. Any individual that is translating this would understand that this does not make sense. But these systems are not at that level today. As they develop, as they become smarter, we will have to ensure that our capabilities as human beings, our research capabilities as well, keep increasing with these systems and that we are able to work with them. We need to also move from being nations that just import technology to na nations that import them, but at the same time uh, have value engineering or value adding uh, efforts with them and export them as well. Being able to work with the technology is critical moving forward. True. Coming to technology, Michael, how might these technologies that are diffusing to new actors be employed to help detect and defend against the threats the diffusion of these technologies present? Well, I mean, we, we, use, we need to understand how these technologies uh, can be used and to sort of how, how, how dangerous stuff will be out there, both even if cyber or physical things or combination of both, of course. 
and, and we use the same technologies to find ways of detecting uh, very asymmetrical threats nowadays that we didn't do before. Uh, as an example, I mean, uh, someone mentioned radar technology nowadays. Nowadays we can, through behavioral patterns, differentiate between a small drone in a flock of birds, uh, which should have been cluttered some time ago, but today it's absolutely possible to detect these dangerous things uh, among a flock of birds. And, um, and also I think data management, uh, big data management is used to, to more analyze and detect uh, deviations in patterns and predict sort of the next steps of things. So instead of trying to understand what's going on exactly, uh, every moment in time in a big scenario, you, you detect anomalies, uh, which, uh, which we haven't seen before. And that's typically what uh, sort of the bad guys are doing. So it's a, it's, sort of a, it's a battle in between trying to find and use the same technology to detect and, and, and destroy them uh, in any new pattern that we haven't seen before. So both in cyber and, and of course, in, on our products as well. Mm -hmm. Moving to the communities aspect, Eric, I would like to hear your view on how do defense and security communities better balance the tension between the need to support commercial innovation and growth with the need to meet an expanding range of threats? Yes. First of all, I would like to, to remind that uh, we use this uh, technology in order to have a combat superiority, information dominance, engagement dominance, and to be able to be uh, very reliable at sea. We use also these technologies for our industrial competitiveness, of course. And, and to do that, we do not need exactly the same technologies that are used for civilian applications. Mm -hmm. I will give you some examples. We have in the, in the defense sector very stringent requirements regarding real-time operation, regarding what we call trusted artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. We have ethical rules, uh, for example, to keep the man in the loop of the decision. We have cybersecurity uh, requ requirements. We need resilience with uh, distributed architectures, with redundancy, with robustness with, uh, with regard with environment. And uh, of course, we need also uh, to have a very um, reliable set of data in order to, to do the machine learning of the systems. Okay? It's very important to know that because what we have to protect it is not the diffusion of artificial intelligence or for higher technology as themselves. That's the militarization of this technology to fit the exact needs of the naval sectors. And if you take, for example, a swarm of drones, as I said before, now they are teleoperated. Mm -hmm. Maybe tomorrow they will be a little bit smarter than that. But if we have these, uh, these swarms of drones that can be robust, to electromagnetic aggression, as it was said by, by our colleagues of, uh, of DEAL. Uh, it will be a great problem for us. So we have to protect absolutely all the military uh, use of this technology, but not the diffusion of the technology themselves. And uh, to do that, we can, uh, we can help a lot because we have the knowledge, we have the, the know-how, the know-why, and uh, we, uh, we, can, uh, we can make critical systems that can be regularly updated, upgraded, in order to follow uh, this, uh, this evolution of technology and putting all the requirements that are necessary for naval application. Thank you. Before we wrap up our discussion, uh, going back to Haiti, what consideration do you take into account before sharing advanced technology with foreign partners? There's always a balance between supporting our allies and ensuring the safeguarding of the advanced technology. So we're governed by the conventional arms uh, transfer policy and the Arms Export Control Act, uh, which require a case-by-case -case review you know, of all defense sales. And we review national security perspectives of a particular sale to ensure uh, regional balance is maintained. And we'll evaluate the capability of our partners and allies and properly how they will properly utilize uh, the equipment to minimize any civilian casualties. You know, from a technology security perspective, as I mentioned previously, the partner nation's ability to safeguard the technology, that is paramount. And the more advanced the technology, 
the more critical um, the protection comes. And you know, technology security, you know, is a, it's a shared responsibility among all who receive and utilize this advanced U.S. technology. And as some of my colleagues here have mentioned, that a compromise by one, you know, endangers all. So we strive to ensure our allies and partners have rigorous technology security infrastructure of laws, policies, practices, and procedures. And that is one of the areas where my organization has been working very closely, especially uh, recently with the Emirates um, on you know, building up the, the institutional capacity to ensure that that protection is in place. You all emphasized on the cybersecurity and how it's playing a critical role in the diffusion of AI and other fourth industrial revolution technologies in defense and security. To conclude our session, I would like to ask each of our panelists to share your final thoughts with us, your excellencies, to start with. My final thoughts are artificial intelligence is not one technology. It's a broad umbrella of many technologies that fall under it. And understanding these technologies, understanding the deployments and the maturity of each is extremely important uh, when we're thinking about defense. The second part is um, it always needs to be a business case as well. If we think about drones and swarm drones, for example, if each explosive drone that comes and wrecks havoc costs $1,000 and the systems that defend our cities and defend the livelihoods of people costs, for example, $200,000 a rocket or $200,000 to defend us, there is a disconnect here between the cost of the artillery and the cost of the defense. Yeah, yeah. So we need to also try to create systems that are able to defend us at the lowest cost to make business sense out of these things. So it's important for us to advance the defense technologies as fast as some people or some parties are advancing the offensive technologies that we're seeing today. Michael? Well, uh, again, um, technology is so good for society, so the size of applications that we will benefit from by having many actors and freely spreading technologies, collaboration across borders is, is absolutely the priority. However, we are behind, I think, when it comes to some sort of international framework and regulation on an assessment of what these technologies can be used for. Uh, and I do think we need to get something like that in place. I do think that we need to look at the Vassanar Arrangement 2.0 over me between many states, uh, because otherwise there will be always malicious um, usage of technologies, but we are as states and uh, behind understanding what people are trying to do the bad guys, so to say, both in the cyberspace and with sort of mature products on the commercial side that they can combine mm -hmm. with, with technologies. So I would go for starting that discussion uh, without limiting sort of the collaboration for the good purposes. It must be possible to do that, otherwise there will be more dangerous stuff out there coming. The problem is not with the defense industry. We are absorbing the technologies. We're even working sort of the counteracting system towards the asymmetric threats that we see, and we're used to regulating on where we can sell and how we protect our technology, because we, we've always done that, because it's a licensed operator. Mm -hmm. But there are all, all the guys in the commercial sectors that we have to start regulating, uh, understanding what's going on. So I, I strongly advise that we start working on an arrangement that is international in this area. Eric? Yes, I would like to, to say again that these technologies are very, uh, a great opportunity for uh, all the sector, especially for, so for the defense sector. Uh, collaboration uh, between uh, actors, academia, industrial, governments, uh, is the key in order to know these technologies and to, to know how they will evolve. Uh, collaboration is also a solution in order to uh, have uh, critical systems that are better together than alone to face the threats caused by these new technologies, like uh, collaborative uh, tactical situation awareness, uh, like uh, collaborative engagement, using one sensor to detect the threat and one weapon, another ship, in order to fight it. Uh, all these collaborative uh, methods are very good, and especially, again, uh, against uh, asymmetric threats, like we, we can fear with this uh, technology diffusion. 
Heidi? Well, we won't be able to accomplish our shared global security challenges without a focus on, on technology. And as more advanced digital technologies emerge, we must have a collective understanding of these security risks that many of us discussed today. Um, and more importantly, how to mitigate those risks to protect not only our investment, but our national and our global security. And I would agree with my colleague about the Vosnar arrangement uh, 2.0. I think you know, looking at the speed of a technology, emerging critical technology, our processes right now to protect are unable to keep up. It can be two years in a Vosner arrangement to get a protection in place. Uh, so I, I agree with my colleague uh, on an international, uh, rallying internationally to look at a Vosner 2.0 or, or type arrangement. Thanks. Thank you for your time to share your valuable uh, insight. It was an honor moderating this session with you.